Okay, well, welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm Amy Mart. I'm the Director of Professional Learning at the Buffett Early Childhood Institute at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and I am thrilled to welcome you to our first ever Professional Development for All webinar, uh, Community Voices, Supporting Children and Families During Challenging Times. And I think I speak for everyone on our team when I say that we have really missed seeing all of our local early childhood professionals in person throughout this year as we've had to cancel several in-person PD for All events. But at the same time, we are really excited about this new online format. And we're hopeful that this could provide access to folks that may not have been able to make it to our in-person events in the past. So we are really, really excited to see so many participants logging on today. Just a few logistical notes. Um, you will see uh, that this is a, in a typical Zoom format that many of you are probably familiar with, uh, <laughs> having worked in this format over the last several months. One feature I want to point out to you is the chat function. Um, you'll be able to see uh, the slides and see the presenters in your main window, but if you click the chat button, you'll also see a stream uh, of comments and questions from other participants and from panelists. Uh, and we invite you to keep an eye on that throughout the presentation to share comments and questions and to start up discussions there. Uh, and our panelists will do their best to field your questions in that chat function throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that. And if there are questions that warrant further discussion or that we you know, kind of like to address to the whole group, uh, we'll go ahead and, and um, shout those out verbally to the panelists. Uh, so that, that we can have a little bit deeper discussion. But keep an eye on the chat for answers to questions as we go. Uh, so I want to begin by saying first just how deeply grateful we are for the incredible work that all of our early childhood professionals have been doing in these challenging times. Today we're going to hear from panelists who've been working tirelessly to support children and families over the last few months, but we know that there are millions of others out there. And we see you, we appreciate you, uh, and we recognize how uniquely challenging the past few months have been. Uh, we're in the midst of multiple intersecting challenges right now that are affecting everyone. We've got the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the accompanying economic downturn, and the civil unrest over the persistent racial injustices that, that exist in our country. This, PD, this year's PD for All series focused on children's social and emotional development, and so we really want to extend that theme during today's panel discussion as there's really no doubt that these events have had a profound impact on children's social and emotional development. I think we as a field are still trying to figure this out and understand it. Uh, and I think the voices we'll hear today will go a long way towards that end. Oh, over the past few months, I, uh, I've often been reminded of a story that I was told once about um, the Maasai tribe in East Africa. Some of you may have heard this uh, as the story goes, leaders and warriors within that tribe, when they greet each other, the traditional greeting uh, that's passed from one person to the next is to ask, and how are the children? Uh, that's the, that's the re recurrent uh, theme in, in those greetings is, is to ask, how are the children? And this question I, has certainly been at the forefront of my mind these past few months, and I imagine has been in the forefront of yours. Uh, and if you're joining this webinar, chances are you wish as I do that in our society, we put the health and well-being of children at the forefront of our minds at all times. Uh, and chances are that you have been pondering this question, how are the children? Uh, it's been one of the most challenging things about the past few months for those of us who care deeply about children and families is not really knowing the answer to that question, how are the children? Are they continuing their learning? Are they staying connected? Are they getting enough to eat? Uh, and unfortunately, we know that the impact of these crises has not been equitably distributed across our communities. Uh, Black and Latino families are more likely to become ill from the coronavirus, we've learned. They're more likely to be out of work or suffer financially as a result of the economic recession. And they're certainly more likely to carry the weight of the myriad racial injustices that have recently been the subject of national protests. And so with that in mind, our discussion today is really going to be centered on the experiences of Black and Latino families in our community and how, how our local organizations have been serving these families, how they're doing, uh, and how we as an early childhood community can most effectively support children as they return to schools and classrooms and other early childhood settings over the next few months. We're gonna hear from panelists from the Learning Community Center of North Omaha, the Learning Community Center of South Omaha, uh, and the Superintendent's Early Childhood Plan, including panelists from Mockingbird Elementary in Ralston and Mount View Elementary in Omaha Public Schools. 
Uh, but before we get started, I have the pleasure of introducing my co-moderator, Dr. Kariana Skye, who's an assistant professor of teacher education at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And Carrie Ann, would you like to say a few words before we get started with our panelists? Sure. Contemporary events have called into question the very nature and structure of US society. Indeed, the phrase liberty and justice for all rings hollow once juxtaposed to the historical oppression, contemporary manifestations of such oppression economic marginalization, and the pain and trauma of African-Americans and persons of color. For some, comforted by racial privilege, along with years of a lack of historical understanding, the mask has been removed. For others, however, this mask is a staple feature of American life. This mask functions to deny racism, often invoking claims of colorblindness, while paradoxically claiming racism does not exist. The long-standing record, historical record of injustice, along with contemporary examples, indicate otherwise. Racism exists in American society. Racism is systemic. Contrary to popular opinion, racism is much more than prejudice, bias, and stereotypes. While these elements are pertinent, it doesn't give you a full picture of what constitutes racism. In essence, systemic racism is predicated on privilege, white privilege, and white power, both of which were derived from colonization and slavery and both of which are reproduced by contemporary inequities and a racialized system. As several race scholars have shown, every, virtually every institution in the United States, from education to housing, to the legal system, to the health system, reproduce institutionalized oppression of African-Americans while simultaneously reproducing privilege and power for white Americans. To make the matter more plain, in every index of social life, white Americans fear better. The wealth disparity continues, owing largely to the intergenerational wealth transfer, along with pay inequity and discrimination in the labor market. Children of color, African American children, continue to experience educational outcomes that signify gross inequities, inequities that demand our attention and sustained efforts to address. Yet a historical context is needed to make sense of these realities, particularly as it pertains to children, families, and communities. From the very founding of the United States, indeed its very foundation, a system of racial oppression was created, designed to ensure political, cultural, social, economic advantage for white Americans. While there have been progress, while there have been some changes over the years, the very root of racial oppression has not changed substantially. As a house with a faulty foundation runs the risk of ruin and destruction. So too, a society's foundation derived from oppression, blood, violence, and theft cannot bring forth the righteous fruit of justice. Living in a society has had a profound effect and impact and continues to have a profound impact on children and families. Indeed, many researchers continue to report on the racial trauma young children of color African-American children encounter, as well as the racial trauma of adults. Racial trauma, however, for children in particular, must address how this particular experience 
affects their social, emotional development as a result of being exposed on a daily basis to images and discourse that dehumanize the identity. Racial trauma is a lived experience for African-Americans, children, and adults. Yet what you will offer here today offers hope, rich insights on the lived experiences that once connected to a broader system of racial injustice can provide a comprehensive analysis of the roots of racism and how it affects in present day, the lives of people of color. To those who are listening, perhaps your identities, your positionalities differ from the panelists as well as myself. Conversely, however, the panelists may offer stories that resonate with your own experiences, validating what may have been disregarded or dismissed or even misunderstood. Those who carry those wounds, I say, I hear you. Microaggressions dehumanize and inflicts a very heavy toll on the psyche of people of color and in particular African-Americans. Yet at the same time, such experiences prompts us to resist, to enact our agency, and to name our reality. What unites us, I would like to believe, is a commitment, a sustained ongoing commitment to radical transformation, possibilities of hope, and possibilities for sincere, authentic, cross-racial uh, solidarity. The time has come for changes in teaching, in the socialization and parenting of young white children, and in society. Justice, a 400 plus weight for justice is humane and cannot therefore be delayed any longer. I humbly submit to you that the time has come and the time is now for justice demands action. Thank you, Dr. Sky. Thank you for those inspiring words. And with, I think without further ado, I'm really excited to, to invite our panelists to share. So we will start with our, our group from the London Community Center of North Omaha. I'd like to start by introducing Jamila Parker, who's the Director of Family Engagement Services at the Learning Community Center of North Omaha. Uh, and Jamila, please, I invite you to introduce your colleagues and share with us a little about the work that you've been doing with families and children over these past months. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Wonderful. Jane. I don't know if everyone can see me because I can't see myself, but I'm hoping that everyone has the capability. There we go. Thank you. So good afternoon. I am Jamila Parker and I am the Director of Family Engagement Services for the Learning Community of Douglas Counties. And I have the pleasure today to have some of our parent university members with me today, my colleagues from the Learning Community Center of North Omaha. I have the pleasure of having Tamisha Harris, who is our program manager, and Laura Contreras, who is our program coordinator. And with Perrin University at the Learning Community Center of North Omaha, we have the pleasure of partnering on average with 250 families annually. With those 250 families, we have about 550 young children connected to those 250 families. So on an annual basis, we are partnering with 800 individuals just with our parent university program at our North Center. 
The families that we partner with at the North Center have children in the home that are six years of age or younger, at least one of the children in the home is six or younger, because we take an early childhood approach with our family engagement efforts and initiatives. And the parents in Parent University, primarily they reside or they have a student that goes to a school in Learning Community Achievement Sub Council too. So that's primarily North Omaha, Northeast Omaha. Um, there's no clear boundaries, but we are accepting new partnerships and memberships in Parent University. So at any time we are having ongoing enrollment. So we encourage you if you have families living in the sub council achievement council too, that you connect with us and help us to continue to partner with more families. When we look at, and my slides are frozen, we introduced the name of the panelists. So when we look at what we mean when we say we're partnering with families, you will not hear people on my team saying how many families we serve. We are serving leaders, so we don't serve anyone. We create authentic partnerships with families. And that's due to having that ongoing process. Yes, today we're focusing in on crisis. And as we know, before the pandemic, a lot of the families that we partner with may have already been experiencing some crisis, not a pandemic, but a crisis that have occurred and impacted the family. And so we always believe in having that ongoing partnership with them to make sure that we're enhancing communication and collaboration. We like to say that we are that bridge between the school and the home and the family and helping them to make sure that we are giving all stakeholders an opportunity to impact a child's academic achievement and success in life. We know that schools can't do it alone, families cannot do it alone, but we always say families are the first teachers, the most important teacher, and the most consistent. And now, especially more than ever, that we're facing a pandemic, we have to learn how to partner. And so we always say to our wonderful partners within the schools in sub two that we partner with, we always say that it's, if you're doing parent engagement, it's not about inviting parents to events. It's about having intentional conversations and strategies around the whole child and them being successful in life and especially in academics. We know that there are benefits of having that parent engagement and we know that children especially those of ethnic backgrounds. Within our program, we have about 52% African-American, about 45% Hispanic families in our program. The remaining 3% we have Caucasian and different immigrant refugee populations that we partner with. And we always say that the best thing that anyone working with children and families can do is to understand that families have aspirations for their child. They never want their child not to do well in school and in life and that they are engaged, but we have to learn how to authentically partner with them so they know that they're not invited to the table. They are the most important piece and person at that table. I will now turn it over to Tamisha and Laura, and they will talk specifically about some of the things that we've been doing the last several months during the pandemic to strengthen the partnership and making sure that our partners and our families, that their needs have been being met. We always say if it's a professional or a personal partnership, if one person is not meeting the other person's need, somebody's gonna get dumped. And we want to make sure that we are meeting these. Tamisha and Laura, can you share with the audience some specific things that we've been doing around COVID? And when they're done, we'll show a small video clip that's just 40 seconds that will highlight some of that work we've been doing. Tamisha and Laura? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, as um, the program manager, um, I work with the home visitors, which we call educational navigators, and some things that they've been doing to help families during this pandemic is they have been, um, we've had diapers and formula drive 
um, where diapers and formulas has been delivered to the center and we distribute them to the families in need. Um, we have been giving them care packages. Um, we have done, um, connected them to community resources for renting utilities. We've helped them um, with schools and families coordinate the delivery of homework packets and food distribution. We have connected them um, by um, connecting them to Heartland Workforce Solutions for unemployment, um, employment applications, job search, resume building. And we've established routines at home to promote school readiness for children and work-life balance for parents. And we've helped parents stay connected with parent university staff, their own social supports, and ongoing communication with school staff. And I think to add to that too, um, we had to get a little creative, um, what was it, in June when we offered a, a more of a self-care class um, for parents just to figure out ways to take care of themselves and their children um, while kind of having these added stressors around them. Um, so we used our Growing Great Kids curriculum for that. Um, and then we also have some other uh, virtual activities that they can do through our Ready Rosie um, program and so that they can access that. Um, and then we also have been kind of figuring out how to provide the library access uh, as well in addition to that so that they still have access to books and um, other things that they can do while at home once, you know, some of them start running out of supplies and things like that. So um, that was something that we were able to do. Um, and I think also it's important to mention um, just making sure to uh, support the social emotional of the parents as well um, because that ultimately does help the children as we know. Um, so recognizing all of the added stress um, that COVID exposure causes, all the anxiety that comes with that, navigating at home learning pretty much overnight, um, financial constraints, um, you know, on top of already existing racial trauma and just things that are going on in, in, in the community. And so um, we helped that piece of it by emotionally supporting our parents, listening to their feedback, um, brainstorming with them um, to promote the children's academics um, and connecting to mental health resources um, as needed and um, offering that class in English and in Spanish so that we can have um, different, our different groups of parents um, have access to that and manage their stress, approach difficult conversations with people in the home, um, and also emphasizing, um, kind of focusing on the, positive, on the positives among all the chaos and also the importance of self-care. Um, so, with that too, we had to figure out more creative ways of interacting with our parents and teaching them how to also not only interact with us, but then their own social circles. I think a lot of people were kind of felt isolated and just alone in this. So it was really important for them to be able to connect with their, their social circles. Thank you, Laura. Tamisha and Laura, thank you for sharing. Let's see if we can share our quick video clip before we take questions and answers from the audience. Just one second. Please be typing in your questions. We're eager to answer questions at the appropriate time. And of course, with all the great practice, you still have some difficulties. Pull it right up from the PowerPoint. One of the things that we always have to work with parents is there's always a way to overcome struggles. So hopefully, do you guys see my screen changing to the video? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, that's okay. Sometimes with working with families, you just have to model. You have to model what you, what about now? Do you see a video? I do. 
Mm -hmm. See how it always works out? It always works out. Quick 40 second video, just to capture visually some of the things that we've been doing that Laura and Tamisha shared. In closing, I just would say that we're honored to be part of this panel today and partnering with families, of course, is for the families and the well being of those students, but it's for all of us, including our community and our city and our two counties that the learning community represents. And so we are just thrilled to continue that partnership and we're eager to entertain questions and hear from our other colleagues shortly. Are there any questions, Amy or Carrie Ann? Uh, well, first, let me say thank you for, for sharing the work that you've been doing. Uh, I'll, I'll pose one question, encourage others to put them in the chat and then and ask Carrie Ann if she has questions as well. Mm -hmm. I, I would ask, uh, as you've been connected with families and sounds like really creating a forum to, to hear from families and, and to you know, stay connected with them, what have you heard are their, their biggest concerns for their children's social and emotional well-being? Um, what, what are they worried about? Mm -hmm. A lot of the families have shared that the loss of the connections to other students, their, their children's peers, there's been a lot of fear with having play dates and we've been encouraging families to go off of the recommendations that from our uh, local leadership as well as the CDC um, and making sure that if there are not other children in the home that they continue to support building the social and emotional development at home and staff um, in our program can assist with that. But we've been very encouraging them to think outside of the box and do some things. But the social and emotional development, they are uh, concerned about it due to the lack of interactions with some other children. Um, currently, we've been hearing from our families about since the children haven't been socialized as much over the last several months, now there's a lot of anxiety about the return of them going to school. You know, when we talk about working with early childhood age children, once they do see those peers, they may not follow the guidelines. And so that's something that we've been working on getting some communication out to our families that we partner with. Um, because as Laura and Tamisha has mentioned, we continue to support all of the growth in the different um, early childhood domains, but really making sure that families are staying patient uh, with the children and providing those opportunities. A lot of our families um, know how to do Zoom and different things of that nature. So thinking outside of the box of how to continue to promote. Carrie-Anne, did you have a question? Yes, uh, first I just wanna thank Jamila, Tamisha and Laura for sharing your perspectives and what you're doing in the community. You're providing such a positive space for parents to articulate their experiences and also to exercise their agency. With that said, my questions more pertains to the support for parents, especially in light of, of all this the racial climate and the racism, the vote racism that we're currently seeing. What supports have been provided for parents for their own social, social emotional well-being as a result of this particular issue? Mm -hmm. Laura mentioned earlier, and Tamisha, I think you want to jump in. Um, we looked at we hear from our families all the time. And something that we heard was the balance, the struggle with the balance of parenting and working um, that at the same time. So it wasn't scheduled on our calendar, but being a good partner, we have to listen to the needs at all times. And Laura had mentioned, we created um, in English and in Spanish, a course, taking care of yourself to be able to best take care of your family and virtually. And in 
the English and Spanish courses, it was very well received and parents were very upfront with saying how stressed that they are and the need to have that sense of community and family um, and the support and encouragement for others was very important. Tamisha, you wanted to add something, I believe. Oh, they, they have been, um, the workers have been very connected to their families and using um, creative ways to be interactive with them. Like some of them have been in the house with their children for long periods of time. So just being able to be flexible and agree to say meet them at the park, sitting in their car, having a conversation while social distancing um, or taking a walk and social distancing and wearing their mask. Um, they've been able to do that for some of the parents. Um, I would say probably the biggest part is being a listening ear for some of those parents, because many of them don't have adult-adult interaction. They're just having interactions with their children. So um, I think it's important for them to be available for those parents. Mm -hmm. as, and as a follow-up, have any of the families or parents expressed the impact them on their parenting um, in their daily lives and if so what are some of the common themes in those um, those narratives Carrie Ann your question cut off just a little bit. can you repeat it please sure I was just wondering have there been any families or parents who have expressed the impact of racism on their parenting as well as their daily life and if so, is there a common narrative across these particular parents' experiences? Thank you for repeating the question. You know, at Parent University, we are very, um, how can I say it, always providing opportunities for um, authentic, honest, transparent, and open conversations. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned in the beginning, 97% um, are comprised of African-American and Hispanic families. And so we always talk about race and um, injustices in our programs. Many of our families with being so diverse and having ethnic backgrounds already from started talking about race and some of the um, inequities in this world. That's about being um, a person of color. That's some conversations that you have to start having early with your children. And those conversations were already being held within the families and within our program as a um, with the recent things that have been going on um, across the world and even more closely with James Scurlock, we have some families that we partner with that are directly related to the Scurlock family. And so having things going on nationally and locally, families have, you know, mentioned that more than ever, it's been so exhausting. And it's been a lot of what we would call noise, um, mm -hmm. not just noise outside, but mental noise and just, you know, having to deal with a pandemic that's been something new. Racism hasn't been something new, but just the impact of already being tired, stressed, trying to mm -hmm. make new normal, and now having this be something that is more fresh because Racism in the lives of many families of color is something that families deal with all the time, but not on top of a pandemic. So this time around, people have shared that it's just feeling different and the need to have those social supports have been more crucial than ever, more mm -hmm. than ever. Well, thank you, Gemma. Well said, well said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're excited to hear from our other colleagues today on the panel. And thank you again for allowing Parent University to be part of the discussion today. So grateful for your perspectives, Jamila, Laura, Tamisha. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I will, I will move, move us along to the next group. And I, there, I know we, there were a couple of questions in the chat that I would actually like to hold to the end and pose to all the panelists together, uh, if that's okay. And, and please feel free to respond in chat to, to questions if you see them pop up. Uh, so now we will we'll have a, our group from the Learning Community Center of South Omaha, Nayeli Lopez. 
uh, will be leading that group. She's the family learning manager at the Learning Community Center of South Omaha. And Nayeli, welcome. Uh, and please and introduce the, your colleagues who are joining you today. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nayeli, as Amy uh, shared. And for some reason, I'm sorry, I can't see myself, but I hope you, <laughs> you can hear me well. Um, I can hear you, Nayeli, wonderfully. Perfect. Uh, so today I am with my um, two co-workers, um, Amanda Phillips, Instructional Manager, and also um, one of our current participants, her name is uh, Maria Concepcion uh, Garcia. So I would like to start um, by saying thank you so much for having us here. Uh, the Learning Community Center of South Omaha, their mission is to enhance children's education. And we do this by doing a two-generational approach. We work with adults by providing adult um, classes, education classes, and then we will support we support our children through two venues. Uh, we provide parenting classes, and then we also have our home visiting program. Um, our program serves around 320 participants a year and between 900 and 1,000 children. Um, since the beginning, the mission of our program is to truly meet our participants um, and thinking about some of the barriers and obstacles that may prevent them from attending our program. Even before we had a location, which you can see here from our picture that we're presenting, the learning community took the time to survey the area and truly ask our community, what were some of those obstacles or barriers that may prevent them from attending uh, classes? which opened up for our center to provide uh, both childcare and transportation so our families could, could attend. In the picture that you see here um, is my coworker, Maria Elena. She's holding a box of diapers, just like the uh, North Center, we also had the opportunity to provide diapers um, and formula to our participants. And one of the things that we highlight in our program is that we always want to provide a welcoming environment for our families. We pride ourselves to, you know, making them feel welcome, like they, they truly belong in our center and we're ever so happy that they committed and wanting to join our program. So in this picture, you can see a sign that says, we miss you. And that's just a little bit of an understatement, even though our families were just gonna come in for a very quick drive through to pick up their diapers. Our staff took the time to rotate and come. Everybody did their signs and they were chanting to our families as they were coming to pick up their diapers, telling them, we miss you, we hope you're safe, uh, be safe, we'll stay in touch. So those are a little bit of the things that we do at our center to make sure that our families feel welcome and excited to come and learn. Uh, part of my role as the family learning manager is to supervise our educational navigators through our home visiting program. Um, I have the opportunity to work with um, five wonderful ladies. Um, all of our staff is bilingual and bicultural, and they have the opportunity to meet with our families um, at least twice a, a month um, and meet where they are. Before the uh, pandemic, they were doing home visits at home, but once this happened and we had to work from home, they were quickly to adapt to transition to video phone calls or, or calls. And they truly were the ears uh, and the voices for our families. When we started our program, uh, one of the things that I mentioned was that we listen to our communities. We don't come in as experts, but instead as partners. And that has resonated as a foundation during these uncertain times. Uh, my team has done a little bit of everything during this time, as I'm sure many of your agencies have had to done as well. They have connected their families with resources to meet some of those financial needs. 
They have helped par participants navigate some of those websites that the Omaha Public Schools recommended to keep the uh, students engaged during learning from home. And they have also helped out with some of that clear communication. Uh, when the schools were recently closed, uh, with a lot of changes that were happening, many of our families were asking my team, is it safe to go outside? How can I tell my children about what is happening um, so that fear and stress will not overcome us? Um, I think that we have a wonderful team in, at the learning community because we truly work and support each other during this time. And that has allowed us to build the trust with our families and meeting them where they are. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce my coworker, uh, Mandy Phillips. She is the instructional manager from our center. And she's going to share about some of the things that we have done um, in order to accommodate for some of our participants' needs. And I think that has been the key to success to maintain the engagement during this time with our participants. Mandy? Hi, everybody. I'm Mandy Phillips, as Nayeli said. I am the instructional manager at the Learning Community Center of South Omaha. So I teach ESL and GED um, in our adult ed program and also supervise the rest of the teaching team. Um, I, I feel really uniquely lucky um, in this teaching position to have Nayeli's navigator team to work with because while our teaching team prides ourselves on having close relationships with our participants, um, as Nayeli said, uh, the navigators really are the eyes and ears of our program because of the constant communication they have with our families. Um, so I, I'm sure for everybody on this call, as soon as we realized we were going to be suddenly doing our, our entire jobs remotely instead of in person as we're used to, um, it, was, it was pretty overwhelming and we had to figure a lot of things out really quickly. Uh, and so one of the first things we did was put together a survey to, we, we've actually surveyed our participants a few times um, because we've needed so much information, um, but we wanted to find out in, in general what their needs were. Um, and one specific area we wanted to know about was um, their tech needs, because this, this time has really highlighted the digital divide, I think, for a lot of organizations, including our own. Um, so we, we did send out um, a link to a survey on Remind.com and on Facebook because our participants are used to using both of those media, but that doesn't necessarily reach all of our participants. And so we're really lucky to have our navigator team who's able to call those participants who weren't able to fill out the survey um, and walk them through on the phone. And that, that gave us insight into what our, our families were, were needing as we started um, quarantine. So one thing that we heard was that while our participants have kids who are the, in the ages of zero to six when they start our program, most of them also have older children. Um, and we heard a lot of people say that they really needed support with their uh, kids working on the packets that they received from OPS. Um, and so our, our teaching team quickly learned how to use video software and create videos and put up a video channel so that we could make um, videos to support our participants and their kids in K through pre-K through three on completing the, the reading, writing, and math portions of their packets, um, which was, it was very different than what we're used to doing, but it was a really great way for us to continue to connect with our families. Um, we also got a lot of information about um, where our families were in terms of having devices that would allow them to access the internet um, whether or not they had Wi-Fi. Um, and so we found that it was a real mix. In some cases, um, we had participants who were ready to jump right onto our ESL and GED classes and use Zoom, um, and there wasn't, there wasn't a huge learning curve. 
for other families, that wasn't the case. They might not have had a device. They might not have had Wi-Fi. They might have thought that they had Wi-Fi, but it turned out that they just had cellular data. Um, and so it's really been a process of figuring out how to work with individual participants and their tech needs, which meant we also were creating um, packets for our adult learners to do things at home, um, a lot of over-the-phone tutoring, so that everyone could still maintain, maintain contact with, um, with our program. Um, we are right now in the process of, we've got three of our ESL classes trying out a laptop pilot. So we've lent out um, laptops, Chromebooks that we have um, in our center to families who are trying them out at home. Um, and we're going to see if that seems like something that it will make sense to scale up for all of our families um, as we as we move into the fall. So, um, but again, I think um, being able to maintain our our relationships via Zoom, via the phone, um, and with the help of our amazing navigator team has been really huge. Um, and before I pass it on to the next person, uh, I'm just going to point out a couple of pictures on this slide. So um, these pictures are of what our team um, has called in English the happy bus. Um, and you can see that that is our Learning Community Center of South Omaha bus um, that usually we use to transport participants to and from our program. Um, but instead we have been using it to go around to the homes of our participants. Um, our, our staff, a few of our staff members go, we're masked up, we social distance, but then we get off the bus um, and we sing the, the songs with the kids that they're used, used to singing um, in our child learning classrooms. So a lot of Baby Shark on repeat for the whole team. Um, I think I sang it 10 times one day. Um, and I, I think it, it has been, I know for me as an employee, it has really fed my soul during this time because more than anything, I just miss being around our families. I think most of us got into this work because we love people and we love connections and we love the families that we work with. And so, so we really miss that opportunity. Um, and by the time I, I got done um, the day that I went on the happy bus tour, even though I was wearing a mask, my face was hurting from smiling so much the entire time. Um, so we feel really lucky to have found creative ways to maintain those connections. Um, and so to give you a little bit more of um, a firsthand perspective, I'm gonna pass it along to one of our participants in our program. Her name is Maria Concepcion Garcia. And she is going to talk a little bit about what it's been like for her and her family um, at home during this time. Hi, my name is Maria Concepcion Garcia. I am a parent participant in the Learning Community Center of South Omaha. I have four children, Clara, age 17, Francisco, age 11, Dharma, age 8, and Jose Miguel, age 3. I am grateful to the center for the support that they are giving during this time of COVID-19. It's a very important, both for my children and for me. For example, with, with a happy bus, my children were also excited to see their teacher. So brought happiness to my home. Also, when my navigator called me, this is also very important for me. My navigator checked on me frequently to make sure and I okay. And when my children see me feeling contact, that is also good for them emotionally, emotionally. And also feel that providing opportunity for us participants to talk that each other is important. Because when we hear what our classmates need, we can find ways to share what we have to with, the, with those classmates. Even if it's small ways, such as sharing soup, toothpaste, and shampoo. Thank you, Learning Community Center, for the opportunity and support you give us. Thanks to you, my, my daughter graduated with honor from high school in, in Agos. She will be a starting in UNL. Thanks to the LCCO for, for giving us the tools to help my children be successful in life. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was awesome. 
I was nervous doing this and um, I've, I've had to teach a lot and do Zoom presentations and Conchis did it in her second language and did an amazing job. Um, so that is, that's all we have. Um, we're ready for questions if you have them. Carrie Ann, do you wanna kick us off? Do you have a question? Yes, a uh, short. Sure. Very similar to what the panelists mentioned from the North Omaha Community Center, you seem to also offer a reciprocal relationship to parents. It seems that that partnership is very reciprocal. In such a regard, I would like to know, how do you use the, how do you use the strengths, the cultural identities of the participants in the various programs that the center offers? Well, just like um, Jamila shared earlier in her presentation, um, we truly take the time, you know, to to meet with our families and and see them as our as our partners. Um, Jamila said they are the first and foremost the, the best teacher their child can have, and that is something that we often say at our orientation. Um, we are merely here to support them and provide them the uh, tools that they may need um, to continue, you know, their pathway that they are already making um, to seek the success for their children. Um, so I know part of my role is also to do the parenting workshops. And one of the things that we mm -hmm. always take into consideration is the feedback from our participants. What are you interested on? What is one of the areas that you will benefit the most from when you're thinking about the success for your children and also for your own success? And mm -hmm. that's something that every year we revisit and we adjust those parenting workshops to best um, accommodate their needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I would, I would add one question to that before we move on. Uh, and that is, uh, as you're, you know, you've gone around in, in the happy bus and, and toured the neighborhoods and really connected with families, um, have you gotten a chance to speak to children? And what are, what are you hearing from children about their experience with this? Um, so I, I think um, one thing that we're seeing is that our, the kids who come to our, to our child learning classes really just miss their teachers, they miss their friends, um, and they, they really want the opportunity to, to connect with each other and to play. Um, our, our participants, I feel like, do a really great job of attuning to the emotional needs of their children. And so we have talked in our ESL classes, sometimes things come up organically, um, and we talk about um, ways to have conversations with kids about um, the pandemic. Um, we also have talked about ways to have conversations with kids about racism. And so uh, I think, you know, it's, I know I have a 10 year old at home and it is evolving and every day is different um, in terms of how she is reacting to the pandemic and to um, the protests and everything that she is hearing about. And so we we're trying to be there for our participants as they help their kids navigate everything. But I know while while we want everyone to be completely safe, we're also really, really wanting to get back together in person as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take this opportunity then to shift us to the, the third of our three panel uh, presentations. And that's uh, representatives from the superintendent's early childhood plan. So I'll introduce my colleague, Chris Lopez Anderson. Uh, who is the interim associate director of associate director of program development here at the Buffett Early Childhood Institute? Uh, and Chris, would you like to take it away and introduce your other colleagues? Yes. Um, hi. Thank you so much to everybody uh, for um, allowing us the opportunity to to visit. I'm trying to like everybody else. I can't see myself. Oh, there I am. There you are. <laughs> Oh, um, the early childhood, um, the superintendent's early childhood plan, I'm going to just pause just a minute as I show, get my screen ready here. There we go. 
Um, similar to what the North Omaha Center and the South Center had shared, you know, we're about working and creating partnerships. The superintendent's early childhood plan is, is very unique and it's, it's wonderful to be part of the Douglas and Sarpy County um, learning community at large. But, uh, you know, several years ago, there was this unique opportunity that 11 superintendents across the metro area got together and work together to create an, an opportunity to bring in and change the structure of our schools for our most vulnerable um, students. I like to say that we're addressing the opportunity gap that has been created very much as Carrie Ann, Carrie Ann had made um, a statement about the inequities and in, in the structures of racism within our school district. Um, our partners are trying, we are trying to create a new way of doing school. Uh, when we look at uh, a school as hub community where we have birth through grade three and beyond um, in that we want to create a system that really looks at families and education and challenges ourselves to look at doing something different. I'm going to try to move into my another um, I can't get my screen to change here, so bear with me for a minute. Chris, while you do that, would you want to introduce the other, other colleagues that are joining you to represent the superintendent's Yes, service? thank you, Amy. Yes, with me this afternoon, we also we have um, Eunice, who is a home visitor from um, Mockingbird uh, in Ralston Public Schools. And we have Meg Searle, who is the principal at Mount View Elementary in OPS. And I have two of my staff members, Melissa Wolfen and Keely Bevins, who are um, education facilitators. Keely is at Mount View and at Liberty OPS schools. And Melissa was at Mockingbird uh, Ralston and at Gomez Heritage in OPS. And with our school as a hub model, we really look at um, looking at the continuity and the equity and um, the quality that we're providing for families. We're aligning that pre-K through grade three in the, in, the, um, in, the, in buildings. We're looking at transitioning into high quality preschool. And we have a home visiting program in our, in our 10 schools, always focusing on those um, important aspects. I'm going to actually move right into um, sharing, having Eunice share with us a little bit of her perspective as she's worked with families in the home visiting uh, program at Mount View. I'm sorry, Mount uh, Mockingbird. Eunice, do you want to go ahead and reintroduce yourselves and um, talk a little bit about what you've been doing in home visiting? Yes, my name is Eunice Casillas, and I am through the superintendent's plan, and I'm stationed at Mockingbird Elementary, which is in Rawson Public Schools. And I support families from zero to five within the school setting. Um, I've done a little bit of everyone, what everyone else has said on the call, but something that really stands with me and my families is thinking outside of the box with this epidemic. Um, it's, sorry, speak up a little bit louder, sorry. Um, what I noticed too within our families and then within our line of work is we have the autonomy like other home visitors at different school sites that we can really focus on our families and figuring out what they really need at that time frame of epidemic. Within my families that we served, I noticed a lot of them have lost employment. Um, and I would, you know, give resources and I would really notice quickly that the family, you know, didn't intend a resource. Um, and I always kind of wondered like, okay, what can I do more? So thinking outside the box was huge for my families. Um, really asking the correct questions of what can I do to a system? I noticed that a lot of families didn't go attend the resources because of lack of a language barrier or they were just afraid. So I, I noticed that I had a shift and be more vulnerable just so I can assist the families. Um, so what I noticed was that me being with them within six feet away, walking up to the school because they did have a language barrier because they didn't have a re, uh, reliable vehicle really assisted. So um, helping our families in that frame set of what can I do more and being just as vulnerable. Um, 
And what I've noticed too was really like a lot of our home visitors, not just jumping into our GGK curriculum, which is amazing, um, taking more time and spending into the check-in, um, just being just as vulnerable with them, using our life experiences too. Because I hear a lot like thinking outside the box, but what does that really entitle within our families? How can I have that really good rapport that they could ask me um, more specific questions, just like another family that was questioning, do, do I have COVID? Do I don't? What, what are the symptoms? Where do I go? What happens to my children if I do have it? And really, I noticed first being a home visitor that I also had to be vulnerable and not have that expertise that a lot of us just think we need right away and need to solve it. So I really focused on that with our families. And I feel like that had that strong rapport of moving forward together, of having my caseload then be working on GGK instead of just starting and like um, North Omaha said, losing families, right? Because our families need that rapport more than ever and need someone to assist them, especially on marginalized populations that we serve. So um, I noticed checking was huge. I spend, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes in check-in instead of the five minutes previously we did before COVID and what's going on. And I am um, talking about race with our more Hispanic families was really hard in the beginning. I noticed that they changed topic. And again, being vulnerable myself, me explaining to my families, this is how I speak to my child. This is how I have a conversation mm -hmm. with my seven year old. Um, that really has opened the door with them to having that rapport. How would you um, do this? Or how would I say that to my child? Or what videos can I promote to? And really opening up of we are our first teachers of our children and what does that look like too? Um, so that was what I've been working on too. So being really vulnerable and transparent, I feel has really helped. Uh, thank you, Eunice, so much for sharing that. I'm going to have Meg, uh, the principal at Mount View, share with us. Meg has had um, an interesting summer and has taken this opportunity to really connect with her families in a very meaningful way as she prepares for the upcoming school year. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I am so honored to be here today with this great group of colleagues. I have already learned so much in this hour and a half, so I'm so grateful to be here. I would love to share with you some of the things I've done to connect to my, with my families and what my staff has done. Um, if you see in the slide that Chris has here, it really outlines the things that I think almost all of us have done. I mean, we've supported families with their basic needs. We've really worked hard to provide this academic and social uh, emotional supports. And that includes all kinds of different um, platforms that we've used, reaching out to families, making sure that they have what they need, asking our social worker to go above and beyond asking um, our teachers to go above and beyond, just like every other school in the city I know has done and all of you have done as well. Um, and really creating that plan for opening. That's where we are right now. We're in the middle of, of creating a pretty intense plan. Our district has, I feel like, done a phenomenal job of communicating with not only our families, but with all of us to really support how we can open safely and get our students where we know they need to be, which is face-to-face. -face. Uh, but we also know that they need to be safe. So all of the things that are outlined on this slide are certainly things that we have done and I know every other school in the city has done as well. I do feel like we've taken it a step further and I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of my staff for their willingness to um, really take it to the next level. So one of the things that we've done um, is we've just talked a lot about how are we gonna continue to connect with our families as far as COVID goes. But when we started to have, like, like Amy said, and I love that phrase, you know, our intersecting challenges, I knew it was an opportunity for me to connect to my Black families in a way that I had not done before. Um, and I love, Eunice, how you kept saying, um, you know, vulnerability and transparency. If there was ever a time, this was my time. And as challenging as I thought it would be, the rewards have been just absolutely unbelievable. So what I did is I, I chose um, and real randomly, I chose just a variety of our, of our families of color and I just, I called. 
I call them because I think one of the things that's hardest about really the the two pandemics that we've got right here in front of us is that we can't be with the people we love and that we need to be with. And that's one of the things that I think is our biggest barrier. We can't be with those people to say, how can I help you? How can I be here for you? Right now, our families need reassurance that their kids are going to be safe when they come to school, physically safe from COVID. I am doing everything possible along with the district and the CDC guidelines and the, all of the, the city leadership to make sure that our students are physically safe. But for me right now, I couldn't ignore the fact that I have to make sure that there's emotional safety, that not only the families, but also the students are feeling that emotional safety. And I didn't know what else to do other than to reach out to our families. Um, so like I said, I called, I've just called just a variety of families. Um, no really rhyme or reason, just people that I um, had connected with, but also people that I hadn't connected with. And, and, I, and I asked them, I just said, how are you doing with your basic needs, with the parenting during a pandemic? This is hard stuff. No one taught us how to do this. So we talked a little bit about COVID and, and the challenges. One thing that I got from all of our families is that they're scared. There is a level of fear um, for all of it. Um, sending them back to school is, is scary. Um, and so one of the things I tried to do is really reassure them that we were doing everything that we possibly could to make sure that their students are safe and that there are other options within our district if they just are not at all comfortable with sending their students to school. But in the second half of the call, I said, you know what, I'd really like to talk to you about even, even a little bit more than um, COVID is um, the racial challenges that we're facing. And there was always a tiny pause. And then, really? Is that one of the, you know, just a real, um, I think, a, a, just a feeling of gratitude on the parents' part that I was taking the opportunity to talk with them. And, um, just incredible conversations with moms who had a fear of sending their, their um, you know, high school or junior high students out to protest. And I said to one mom, I know it's really scary. My son went and protested too. And then I stopped myself and I said, I am so sorry. Your fear is different than mine. And I know that. And I don't know what to do about that other than to just tell you I'm recognizing that that's so different. Um, families saying, you know, can we, can we talk, and me inviting people, telling them, I want to talk more about race when we can be back together. And what that will look like for us is going to have to depend on a lot of different factors, physical safety for starters, but also um, what type of group, I've worked with Keely a little bit and talking about what kind of group can we get together at school? What community members will we include? What will that look like? What will we call it? I want it to have a mission that's um, a safe place where we can come and talk about race, that our teachers can ask questions and not be fearful for you know, their lack of knowledge, because that's really, if we can't talk about it, we can't move forward. Um, and so, I've just been so incredibly grateful for these conversations that I feel like have, have really opened a door for me um, to move forward in this area in a way that I, I never ever could have imagined. We have a lot of work to do as far as um, action steps. And, you know, I read, a, I read an article yesterday that said, basically the, the crux of it was, if you're only worried about masks and social distancing, you've missed something big. And I thought, okay, that's it. We are, I'm not just worried about masks and social distancing, although that's a big piece of it, but we're having conversations beyond that when it comes to our racial injustices and what my part is and our staff and how we can um, really take that action when we get back together. My staff is currently working on doing some reading and um, and doing some educating of themselves, which I have to be really careful of because they've been through a lot as well. Um, so I need to let them have their summer break while I'm encouraging them to also really read some great books, re listen to amazing podcasts, do some things that you can do so that at least you're, you're looking at 
um, as we get back together, um, some of the action steps that we will all take as a, as a family. Um, so I know it's tip of the iceberg, and I know it's um, scratching the surface, but it's, it's, it's been amazing and I'm so excited to move forward with all of it. Um, so we will keep commuting with our families this summer with robocalls, newsletters, um, all of the things that we've been doing all along um, and really putting their fears at ease as much as I possibly can, not only with COVID, but also with our racial tensions. Um, so we've got challenges that we are facing, but, um, but we're in a great place at Mount View. So um, that's a little bit about what we've been doing. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, I hope that the audience could really get a sense of the commitment that Meg has as a principal and how she, along with other principals in our 10 other schools, realize that being an educational leader is confronting um, the racial injustice within the school structure and how we do school differently mm -hmm. has to include um, our conversations and our journey, our racial journey and understanding that um, as typical white women or men um, and our students being a black Latino, that we do have to um, grow ourselves and, and look at that differently. I'm very, very proud of the work that is being done. I know that we want to get to the um, end of the, the, the big, the, all the questions to answer. I just, just want to highlight quickly that Keely and Melissa, the two educational facilitators, they have, have worked along with the other colleagues at the Institute very closely with the teachers to help them support the distance learning and growing their proficiency and um, that blended learning concepts that it's, it's not going to go away. We need to uh, learn how to reach out and to engage um, at a high level of instruction rig instructional rigor with our families and really take an opportunity to look at, as we've all said, outside that box of we've got families who have real challenges with technology, um, with parents working. How can we work with our families who um, need a different kind of educational opportunity um, that is involving technology and distance learning. Um, it's interesting, I was in a, a webinar not too long ago and they talked about remote learning. Remote learning means that you're disconnected. We don't want our families to feel disconnected um, in, a chan in a time that we need to be more connected with them in a virtual platform. So Amy, I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and um, Hopefully there'll be a question that Keely and Melissa might be able to answer um, from the perspective of what teachers are doing out there too. That would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen, do you want to get us kicked off? We're going to do uh, some Q&A now for the whole panel. So we'll just pose a few questions, uh, Karen and myself will, uh, to the whole panel. And anyone who feels like they have the, the perspective to speak to the question, please feel free to speak up. Uh, and as we're doing that, I invite all the participants to um, be thinking of questions that you might like to pose to the group that you haven't gotten to, to put out there. Put those in the chat and we'll be keeping an eye on those and, and field them as we have time. Uh, mm -hmm. So Karen, go, go ahead. What would you like to know from, from this, this large group of, of phenomenal uh, early childhood professionals? Um, I have so much to say, but so little time. <laughs> um, to Meg's point though, um, that really resonated with me. And Meg, I just want to start by saying, and this is from an anti-racist theory and practice perspective, that by you willing to engage in that transparency, willing to confront on a personal level these issues, particularly race and racism, demonstrate one critical area of anti-racist teaching and, and practice, and that is critical self-reflection. And you follow that up by suggesting materials and resources to teachers so they can themselves can embark on this journey of critical self-reflection. My only question is regarding how teachers are engaging with this material because at times they will need some guidance mm -hmm. to address the cognitive dissonance, especially when, when the, the narrative contrast so sharply with deeply embedded views about themselves, about the U.S. society. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that mm -hmm. teachers can be, you know, guided along this journey? Um, 
with someone else who's doing the anti-racist work? Right. Um, I think that is that right now is probably one of the biggest challenges I'm facing because, like I said, I want to engage my entire staff, who is, um, you know, 90% Caucasian, and really help them get a little bit of self-awareness um, without fear. I think that's the piece we really have to remove is is fear. Um, I just finished this morning, I just finished um, I'm Still Here by um, Austin Channing Brown. And that I think would be a great place for, for staff members to begin because it's, it's an easy, I shouldn't say, it's a quick read mm -hmm. um, and it's phenomenal. A white fragility is a place I wouldn't want my staff to begin because it's, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit, it's, it's, right. it's so heavy and it's, it's a lot to embrace right now. Um, and like I said, they've been through a lot too. And they're, they only, not only have with, you know, gone from teaching to students to remote teaching and dealing with the fear of their own health and their own family. So I'm trying really hard to strike that balance with everybody, our families too. I mean, we had families say to us, you know, we love you guys, but you gotta leave us alone for a minute. We're stressed. And so, you know, I think everywhere we go, we're trying to strike that balance. Um, but as a leader, I just, I just can't let this opportunity fade. That's, I think, my other biggest fear is that, um, you know, when, it, when the dust settles, so to speak, we can't let the dust settle. We gotta keep kicking up that dust. And um, in a way that's gentle and um, safe and meaningful. So you're right. Um, and so someone asked if I could re, re, um, rephrase the, or repeat the book, it's um, I'm Still Here. Uh, by Austin Channing Brown, um, you know, and the first line in it is white people are exhausting. And I love it so much. I laughed out loud when I read that first line. And uh, um, so that is a great place that I, I'm going to encourage, hopefully a book study um, mm -hmm. in a gentle um, way with my staff. And um, so, but we do have work to do in how we can really increase that self-awareness for our staff members, for sure. There is no doubt, for sure. I think here, if I could just add to, to sure. Matt, um, at the Institute, um, my team, Keely and Melissa and the others, we will, we, we are more than happy to facilitate mm -hmm. the, um, that book study so that May can be and the other principals can really just be a participant along and really be vulnerable. How, how we, if we can help them by taking the lift off of having to facilitate it and, and stay in protocol to mm -hmm. elicit um, all the different emotions that we are and recognize where people are. Um, we've really worked intensively with our own team to have those racially rooted conversations, those courageous conversations. Um, and we've had success in having some book studies um, that have resulted in some work being done in our schools, um, reading um, Zaretta Hammond's um, Don't Look Up, um, Culturally Responsive teaching in the brain and we've actually then done your book Carrie Ann um, <laughs> don't look away and uh, so trying to give um, principals and teachers an option to look at what might be a good fit for them uh, but a book study in and of itself is not going to change the system no. we want to be able to to support and the journey of awakening and then what can we do to change the practices in our schools? What will we do in our, uh, when you talked about identity and positionality, everybody has an identity and positionality in the building, in the school community. And we want to um, use that to grow. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I, I would love to pose a question that's sort of a variant of, of one that was posed in the chat by one of our participants. And that is, um, what action would you like to see people in our community, our community more broadly, not just the early childhood education community, but our community more broadly, what action can people be taking to help promote the health and the well-being of the families that you've been serving? What do you need in order to, to help do your work uh, more effectively? I have a really simple response, um, but it is to wear a mask and encourage other people to do so as well. Um, I think we, it is, 
it's a way that we can potentially start to get this under control. And I know that's a really basic answer, but I feel like we all have to be advocating for that very simple action. Thanks, Mandy. Who else has thoughts about that? The things that we always say to our families is the airplane analogy, right? So for you to be able to take care of anyone else that's in a crisis, put that oxygen mask on yourself first so you can be of good service and support to others. I think when we look at the question, how can we support families in this time of unrest to really do some self-reflective work. I love everything that Meg shared today from her seat as a principal and with her responsibility to um, help bring her team of instructional team teachers and everyone in her building along in that journey of self-reflection. I think for us to be able to support others, we have to look at uh, doing the hardest thing ever is putting up that mirror and asking ourselves, how am I contributing to the solution or the problem? Really starting with self. And to be a good servant leader, we have to be genuine in our contributions to others. You know, it's time where everyone wants to get involved. I would challenge people to ask themselves why and how can I best be of support? And sometimes that support is, let me start with self and see how can I be more informed in my thinking and my practices? Is my personal and professional circles one of diversity? How have I move that agenda along before it became national attention. And if I haven't, how can I start now? That's okay. It's always a way to start. And I always will say, start with us before we try to do on to others. Mm. Well said. Wow. I love that, Jamila. I, I love everything that you shared. And, I, and I'm, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think if we can also just continue the conversations in a way that doesn't, it's not scary. I mean, if, like I said earlier, if we can take away the fear and if we can just be patient with each other and ourselves, we've been through a lot. I mean, holy, we've been through a lot and our staff, our students, our families, we just, we just need to be patient and give each other grace. That's the other thing that I keep telling my staff, you know, just, we're going to get there. We've got to just be patient. So I think that's a really great segue into my last question. I mean, the purpose of PD for All is really about, you know, the early childhood professionals who are serving children and families. And a lot of the folks in our audience are getting ready to welcome children back to school or back to childcare or back to whatever setting where they're working. So in, in just a few brief words, does anybody have any advice to those folks who may have been away from children for months now and are getting ready to be back with them again? I think we need to be prepared for um, trauma. And again, this is, it's the social emotional needs. And what do we as the organization need to um, relearn, re-enter re ourselves in understanding that there is a function to behavior, that children will, um, and, and parents and staff will be responding, will be, um, there's a function for their behavior and how can we understand what that be, what the function is and, and be there. Thanks, Chris. Who else has uh, that? I just have one question. Um, it's from a teacher educator standpoint. I teach family-centered partnerships, so now I'm all excited. I want all of you to come to my class next time. <laughs> all right? And, and I teach this class from an anti-racist perspective. Specifically, I encourage my students to interrogate the perceptions they have about families of color and what constitutes parental engagement. Based on your experiences, what are some perspectives of parents? What are some of the lived reality of parents that my students, you think, need to know that not only challenge stereotypes, but show parents or demonstrate parents from a strength-based perspective. In two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How do we challenge the stereotypes based on your experiences working with parents? Great question. 
it makes me think about the innocent classroom work and making sure that your students know that children are born innocent, they are a blank slate. And as I mentioned earlier, that all families have aspirations for their children and they want to be engaged. As institutions and professionals within this field, we have to learn how to partner with them in an authentic way, not to get our needs met, but to really have those continuous conversations with families, to get to know them, to be able to recognize their strengths, to be able to capitalize on them. If we won't be able to recognize family strengths without having authentic conversations with them, with the goal on our agenda is to have them partner in their child's well-being and education. We can't invite them in for the school events and not invite them in to what can we do to best support the learning of your child that you birth, that you've been with, help partner with us. We have to have those opportunities for authentic partnerships. Because the things that we carry with us, those are learned. And as we all will agree, our children are very innocent. They're born with blank slates and they are molded into what we pour into them. And so as those that are fortunate and privileged to work with students and families, how are we pouring into the students and the families? Thank you, Jamila. I, I think that's a beautiful note to, to send us off on. Uh, and I'm just so grateful for all the perspectives that have been shared today and for all the work that you all are doing. I have just a, a few things to wrap us up. Uh, first, uh, I hope that everyone will make plans to join us for the two subsequent webinars in this series that will focus on uh, you know, continuing to support children's social and emotional development. The next one will be entitled Fostering Supportive Relationships for Social and Emotional Learning in Early Childhood. You should be getting an email in the next few days with uh, logistics and, and details about that one. Uh, and then coming up a few weeks later, we'll be helping young children cope with strong emotions. Uh, as I know that all children are experiencing some difficult feelings in the, in the context that we've just discussed today. So please plan to join us. Keep an eye on your inbox and plan to join us for those. You'll all, if you check the box that you need um, a certificate for attendance of this webinar to get for your licensure or certification, that will be coming to your inbox directly uh, in the next week or so. Please keep an eye out for that and let us know if you don't receive it and if you need one. Uh, and then last but not least, we would be very, very grateful for your feedback on this webinar. It's our first, as I said, our first online learning experience with you all. And we would really strive to continuously improve the, the supports that we're able to provide for your learning online. So as you exit the webinar today, as you click the leave button, uh, a link will pop up for a one minute survey that we really hope everyone will just go ahead and complete right on the spot so that we can get your feedback about your experience today. Uh, again, very grateful and hope that we see you all again uh, online soon. Uh, and more importantly, that we're able to see you again in person for, for some learning sometime very soon. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.